do I have to stand here? Can I run around? Oh, yes. Okay, thanks. Philosophical perspectives on Iranian history. If you just walked in and you're one of my students who really cares, and you're here because you want to learn the Socratic method, how to say something and ask a question, then there's a handout here. Andrew has it. Uh, if anyone wants it, just come on down. As I'm going, if you need to go to the bathroom, just go. If you need to eat food, just eat, unless eating isn't allowed in this room. Whatever you need to do, just do it. Don't feel awkward. Handle your business. I am just going to speed through ideas. I am just going to throw ideas at you and we're gonna move on. So if you have a piece of paper or something to write on, if you have a writing utensil, then please keep track of your own thoughts. There will not be time for us to pause and all think together like a real classroom. So let's just jump right in. We're gonna go over history of Iran. I'm gonna talk about myself. I'm gonna specify what's going on in Iran for the last hundred years, 2020, all the way back to 1920. We're gonna talk about some American values and we need those values so that we can argue that things are right or wrong. And then we're gonna apply those theories and ask what is right and what is wrong. So this talk is about Iran. Iran is a country, just a sliver of the entire globe. Think about the globe, it's a very big, place. It'll take you half a day to get to the other side of it. But if you zoom out, we're all on a rock shooting through space around a big star. So how do you just point to a random country on earth and then give a talk about just that country as if it's not connected to everything else or anything else? So thinking about where Iran is, it's the cradle of civilization. Lots of professors tell us that some of the oldest proof that human beings have brains and did stuff is here in Iran. In Iran, you can go to this place now and you can find stone engravings that are 10,000 years old. And I'm gonna talk about that area, but not talk about anything or anyone else. Impossible. We are going to talk about a bunch of things if our focus point is Iran, the ancient land of Persia, where they have pottery, which shows they had a surplus of time from 6,000 years ago. If you're worried about just living, you're not making pottery. So 6,000 years ago, some really beautiful stuff was going on. And you can visit this part of Iran and you'll see how old and ancient the people are there. Here, there's people who live still. There's about 700 people that are still in this piece of land that we call Iran. It has a very ancient culture. If you look at poetry and you look at literature, you see that it comes from the Persian people. It comes from Iran. There's uh, architecture and buildings and ways to make bridges that are just so phenomenal and so old that to study Iran in the last hundred years as if to ignore its history, that's, we're not gonna be able to do that. And I'm not gonna pretend to do that. Iran has some of the most beautiful landscapes. This is a lake that just turns red and pink in the summer. There is so many beautiful things about Iran and its people. I got to go to Iran. Um, actually, I got to go to a lot of places as an American with an American passport born and raised. The globe is very friendly to Americans and I have lived a very privileged life and my love for food and other cultures, food and languages and art and history and knowledge has led me to explore the world. Those are the countries that I've seen so far. And Iran, Iran was a special place for me because apparently like that's where my people are from. That's my blood, that's my culture. Both of my parents are Iranian. So when I went there, it was like, oh my God, I am connected to this. This, this is my people, these are my ethnicity, this is my blood, this is my heritage. And as an American growing up, like watching Barney. I had no idea that Iran had so much to offer. And when I went to Iran, then I started thinking, who am I? What history am I a part of? So going to Iran was really important also for my parents to take me there because they were like, we're taking you to your mother country. 
Uh, my parents, they immigrated to the United States in, in 1979. And I was four when I started learning English because my parents, they thought they teach you things in school. So why would we teach her English? School will teach her that. So in kindergarten, people are doing like pink and yellow and one plus one. And I'm like, I speak Farsi. It was very difficult, but I did do what they wanted me to do. They came here for better opportunities and I didn't waste those opportunities. I got an associate's degree from Santa Monica College, which was a huge thing for me with ignorant, uh, I almost said ignorant parents immigrant parents <laughs> they didn't speak english they didn't grow up here so for me to get a college degree was spectacular spectacular from esl to college degree and i thought that was big until i went to ucla and graduated with a bachelor's in philosophy where my philosophy professor at ucla tyler burge was trying to convince me to go to stanford and i was like are you sure like I thought that was big until I got my doctorate dissertation and I had it printed out and I was so happy that I wrote a book and they published it and smart people thought I was smart. So this, if nothing else, is a talk that says you can go from ESL to PhD. If nothing else, this is a talk that says transfer goals with donut holes or whatever. Like that works because I was at a community college and now Look, look at me now. Right? So um, here I am, uh, an assistant professor of philosophy at a college whose mission it is to expand minds, and to change lives. And that's what I want to contribute today. I want to contribute to the mission of the school for which I work. And I'm going to do that by expanding your minds. You know how knowledge is power. And by changing your life. And one student at a time, I think, I can change the world, can't I? So those are my goals. So here are my really questions. We're going to start with questions. Uh, I'm really grateful that I grew up in America. But like, why did my parents come here? Why did so many people leave Iran with my parents? And out of all the places in the world, why did they come to America? Turns out in 1978, 1979, and 1980, thousands of people left Iran specifically and came to America specifically. Let's zoom in on that. The spike is around the 1979 revolution. 35,000 people, including my parents, fled because of that thing. So what's, what is that? Well, a revolution is when there's a fundamental change in a system. It's when an entire government is overthrown. The consequences of a revolution are unknown because once you take the people in power out, better people can take over just as likely as worse people can take over. So revolutions, looking at them, sometimes things get worse. Sometimes things get better. Of course, we're focusing on the 1979 Iranian revolution, but, but think about it. Have you heard of these things? Because if not, the thing you carry with you everywhere you go, it has all the answers. You, you can look it up. You can learn more. 1979 revolution, when I look it up, the internet tells me to start in 1977. Okay, fine. I like research. I'll go down the rabbit hole. I want to learn about 1979s. So I'm being told to look at 1977. Okay, I'm not afraid of work. Let's go there. In 1979, in January, journalists, intellectuals, lawyers, politicians, activists, all these people, okay, blah, 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 criticizing the accumulation of the power of the hands of the Shah. Well, if they were criticizing something, they were already upset. Let's keep going. A 10-night poetry festival organized by the Iranian Writers Association at the Goethe Institute attracts thousands criticizing. OK, so obviously, we can't start in 1977. Because if somebody's angry, what are they angry about? Are they justified in their anger? It looks like we need to back up. Back and way up, back and way up. Because I don't think you can carve out one tiny piece of this planet and then just talk about it as if everything else is unrelated. So we are going to back up. Remember those ancient Egyptians and the pyramids and the towers of Giza and how astronomically accurate those buildings are? Did you remember learning about these things, ancient civilization? Let's go back a little bit further because a thousand years before the Egyptians were making those pyramids, 
the Persians were doing some pretty cool stuff too. Mesopotamia. Iran is a tiny slice of what's left over of the Persian Empire, which is a tiny slice of Mesopotamia, this ancient civilization. And this is there. You have a question? Oh, cool. Good. I'm glad. Good. So here we are. This is where we are. That's ancient Mesopotamia. Iran is what's left over from this super old history. Turns out there's lots of cradles of civilization. The Western world talks about Egypt a lot. Uh, there's lots of connections there. But all over the world, there's different parts that have thousands of years ago sprung up with education and medicine and religion and all sorts of really cool things. Of course, we're going to focus on Mesopotamia because we're going to focus on the Middle East because we're going to focus on Iran. But I just wanted to mention that there's so much to learn. Why is the cradle of civilization in the Middle East? Like Middle East? If, 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 if Mesopotamia and these ancient Persians are the center, then like Middle East from whose perspective? Mesopotamia, 4,000 BC, and we're in 2023. So if you want to do the math, you have to add 2023 plus 4,000. And that's how many years ago that thing may have been built. Like margin of error, margin of error. Super old, super cool. Who are these people? Okay, so the Persians are the part of this lineage that goes back to Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism is the oldest monotheistic religion. The oldest religion that said that there's one God and no God, but that one God. Zarathustra is the prophet in that religion. We're not sure exactly when he lived, but maybe it was 1,000 BC, so 3,000 years ago. Maybe it was 1,500 BC, so maybe even longer than that. But the first people to become monotheistic were the Persians. Nobody else on earth that we have records of was monotheistic. So that's the first thing that was really interesting. Um, but like, why is Zoroastrianism excluded from your search results? If you were to Google monotheism, why do you see Christianity? But not, but not Zoroastrianism, if it was the first. Here is Mesopotamia broken down according to the records of who was running that area of modern day Iran, mo modern. So this is like the old words. Sir, have a seat. All these people are super friendly. Come on in. So on the left, you see southern Mesopotamia. You have Gilgamesh, who apparently that was a legend. On the right, you have northern Mesopotamia. All of these are, they're all lists of the rulers and from when to when they ruled. Now, these are really, really old records. I wonder if we can trust these records. If you go into a history book and you're taking a test on like Egyptology, though that's definitely like those are the answers that you have to write. But um, can we trust records from 2000 years ago? Uh, some of us don't trust what's on our phones today about what's happening today. And I'm telling you, the Persians are so great. Look at how long ago they did these great things. But can like, can we trust those records? Let's just trust the records and move on. But notice the Socratic method. You question even what you believe. You question even what you're about to believe and then develop other ideas from. Cyrus, Cyrus the Great, the person who is responsible for unifying North Mesopotamia and Southern Mesopotamia, an ancient Persian emperor. Why he's so important is because he was running, uh, I want to say Iran, Persia at a time when the Silk Road was blooming. Remember the Silk Road? Remember the Silk Road? It's how all of the ancient world did any trade with all of the ancient world. A huge portion of it, where Iran is literally in the middle, was called the Persian Royal Road. The Persian Royal Road is one of the main arteries. See that T is capital because I copy pasted it from a website that said the main because that website was ignoring 
a lot of different and really important people. One of the main arteries of the Silk Road. If you wanted to buy or sell anything from anywhere in the entire world, as they knew it, you had to go through Persia. You had to go through Persia. And that's why Persia became so powerful. Of course, you could have gone through their seas, but if you were gonna if you're gonna transport something out of Egypt into China or into China out of Egypt or all the things that were transported east to west or west to east, Persia got a cut of all of that. Um, is it justified to tax foreigners who want to cross through your land, uh, your land? Um, who can own land? So Cyrus de Grace is super important because he unifies the north and the south. They get together and make the Persian Royal Road, which connected parts of the Silk Road. And the Persians, they had a lot of wealth. They also had a lot of knowledge. They had a lot of medicine. They had a lot of art. They learned a lot of stories. Because what happens when you're trading? I know today you go to the market, you pick a slab of beef. And then you put it down and you're like, hey, what's up? And then you buy your whatever you bought and you go home. But the markets in the ancient world, you actually talk to people if you could speak their language. You traded ideas. You traded culture. You traded religion at the market. It wasn't just a here, here's a dollar. So Persia got a cut of all of that. And Cyrus the Great, he's not just important for his expeditions and the roads and then for taxing everybody else, so it enriching the Persians. But he also was a humanitarian. He believed in equality for all, which is a very new idea because usually in the ancient world, when you see those people over there, you're going you're gonna to kill them and you're going to take their stuff because it's their bloodline or your bloodline. But this guy, Cyrus the Great, decided, no, no, even if we're going to conquer you and control your land, you can be free. You can have your own religion. So Cyrus the Great is really important for the Jews, especially because he freed the Jews who were slaves in Babylon, and he even sent them to Jerusalem so that they can rebuild their temple at the, at the time. So he is very important. One thing that we have left over, if you ever go to England, check this out on the museum, it's the Cyrus Cylinder, which is one of the first times somebody with power said something like, don't rape or murder or steal or pillage, that person has rights. Ethnic equality, religious equality, gender equality, Persians. What? That's my people, I'm related to that. Um, wait a minute. How does Persian history get displayed in the museum of other nations? So if you conquer, can you, is it like you just you can just take what you want once you're conquered? Persians have discovered all sorts of things and invented all sorts of things. If you look at my display that I brought from home, I brought a santur, which is one of the first string instruments. Uh, I bought that for myself when I turned 30 and I was like, I'm going to learn how to play. <laughs> I brought a backgammon. I brought all sorts of really interesting things. Persians were the first ones to discover that if you bury your food, it will make it last longer, even in the summer, because it's colder in the earth. Remember those pictures I sent you of people living in the mountains? Yeah, they, they came up with refrigeration. Also, when the Silk Road was going on, the Persians were in control of everything that went west and everything that went east. And they also invented the postal system. The idea that there should be somebody waiting here in case somebody comes with a message, they can pay us to go deliver the message, then they can keep moving. A bunch of things. The Persians came up with a bunch of things. This is the Persian Empire at its highest, at its greatest, at its most elaborate stage. The uh, darker road that right above Babylonia and it goes all the way to Greece, that's the part that the Persians controlled, like a, like a really big part. Um, I looked for a map that would zoom out and show that road on a modern day map so you can see where Turkey is and where Greece is and where Afghanistan is. Couldn't find it. 
but um, that would be cool if somebody wants to be my research assistant and you know, you know that'd be cool because I think that'd be really nice to see our words on this map so we can see where the Persians really were. Aria, Aria is the Aryans. Persians are Aryans. So this map is using ancient words that should say Iran. Iran, when you go all the way to the north, is the Caspian Sea. Iran, when you go all the way to the south, is the Persian Gulf. So that all of that is Iran. It says Arya, that's, that's no longer Iran, Persia, et cetera, et cetera. This is Persepolis, a part in that map. Persepolis, uh, I went there, but when I went there, my phone, the coolest thing on it was snake. You couldn't like take selfies back then. So I don't have a picture of myself here, but this place is amazing. I know it looks like there's really tall poles, but when you go there and you're staring at this really tall pole and somebody tells you 4,000 years ago humans did that, the details of their work is remarkable. This is Persepolis in Iran. There's a book down here, the title is Persepolis, there's a link. Uh, there's a black and white comic book that is written from a person's perspective who went through the Iranian revolution. Those are the books and the video that I have up here. So this is Persia, um, about 500 years BC. All of this used to be Iranian. But then the Greeks started their conquests. And then Alexander the Great, remember him, and all of the people that he employed. The Greeks took over, and they inherited the land, the people, the ideas, the culture, the medicine, the religion. A lot of things spread, and a lot of things started changing. Everything here in this like maroonish color is the empire of Alexander the Great. I remember that movie, 300, totally inaccurate, but the Persians lost, finally. To the Greeks. This is what was uh, Alexander the Great's land. There is Parthia, there is Arya, all of that is modern day Iran. Uh, is killing justified if you see a bunch of Persians running and then you, like, you want to make that yours? Can you kill people for the sake of nationality? The Islamic conquest started after Muhammad, who is a prophet in Islam, started spreading Islam around the year 600 AD uh, or common era. And then what you see here in the green, this is the conquest from 1600, sorry, 600 to about 800, the area that is now the Middle East just became Muslim. Is killing justified if it's to spread Islam? And then the Crusades, okay, we're going up because we're gonna get to the 1920s. The Crusades come over when there is uh, the Great Schism of 1095, and the Christians are fighting each other. There's the Roman Holy Empire, and then there's the Byzantine Greek Orthodox Church, and they disagree on how to be Christian. And the Byzantinians weren't sending any tax back to Rome. So the Romans, the Pope himself, you know, the speaker of God, said, we need to go over there and we need to spread Christianity. And that's what started happening. Now, if you notice what those, gr those green lines are, they get as close to the Middle East as Jerusalem, which used to be Persian territory, and then it was Greek territory. Uh, but it stops there. By the end of the Fifth Crusades, a lot of that land on the left turns Christian and is no longer Muslim. By the end of the Sixth and the Seventh, Still, Christianity does not reach Persepolis. They still keep it Muslim. And since we're asking questions, is killing justified to spread Christianity? And then there were the Ottoman conquests. You see, we keep getting closer and closer to today. The Ottomans are Muslim. They're a different Muslim than the Arab conquests because they're Turkish. Muslim. There's lots of different ways to be Muslim, just like there's lots of different ways to be Christian. The Turks and the Ottomans, they start spreading Islam. So that land that was Christian starts becoming Muslim, but, it, but a different kind of Muslim. 
if you're wondering where's like Europe and stuff, Europe was busy on the other side of Africa. I've been talking about that area that's orange. The orange part is the Middle East, the part that relates to Persia, ancient Persia. But the other side of Africa, there's a lot going on there. There's so much knowledge and skills and culture and natural resources and diamonds, religion, so much there. So Portugal and Britain at this time were busy taking natural resources. And by then, around that time, people were included as goods, values. Nine million, some resources say, up to 13 million, some resources say, Africans were taken from their land along with other natural resources. So that's what's going on tangentially. Is it possible to justify treating a human as property? Aristotle defended slavery. Should we stop reading Aristotle? So the Ottoman Empire was huge, and a lot of this area was really Muslim, but a lot of things started happening in the 1700s. In the 1700s, Europe was getting a lot of labor for free or cheap, the slaves that we just talked about. There was also the Industrial Revolution. There was also a switch to petroleum. Lots of things in the background affected the power in this area. So you see Persia got a lot smaller, got a lot smaller. In the 17 and 1800s, the Ottoman Empire was losing power. If you look at just 1818 to 1920, so many changes were made. So many changes were made. How can it be that within 20 years, all of a sudden we have all new countries, all new states, all new arbitrary lines of who's this and who's that and property and natural resources and power. How did that happen? What was going on? World War I. World War War World War One was going on, and of course it would have effects on everything around it. If you're thinking, wait a minute, Japan didn't work with United States. That's that's World War Two. But stay with me. We will get to the future. Great Britain and France and Russia and Italy, Romania, Canada, Japan, and United States. There, the Allied powers. The Allied powers are fighting together. They're fighting the Ottoman Empire, which explains why it lost power and lost power and got smaller and got smaller. Other nations started popping up all over the place. When one group conquers another, what does it owe the constituents, the people who are there? Like if another group comes in and takes over and says, we're your government now, what do they owe us as, as humans, as humans? Uh, if you look at these color coding, and sorry if you're colorblind, this might not be the perfect map to use. I couldn't find a better one. You'll see the area of Africa that the Brits controlled, the area that the French controlled. You'll see that Parsi, Parsi, you see Parsi? That's Persia. That's Iran. Remember, there's the Caspian Sea on the north, and there's the Persian Gulf on the south. People from Europe started coming into the Middle East and then drawing arbitrary lines in the sand and taking over. Uh, when they did this in the 1914, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19, uh, the problem was that the Europeans didn't understand that all Arabs are not the same, that there's Muslims, and Muslims can be Sunni, and they could be Shiite, and they could be Wahhabi, and they could be Sufi, and those are very, very different kinds of people. Just like if you're a Catholic, you're going to disagree with some Lutherans and some Presbyterians and some Latter-day Saints and some Mormons. And so like, there's differences amongst people that are really hard to understand if you don't sit down and listen and get to know other people. So a lot of conflict was caused while this was going on. In 1915, the Armenian genocide that was going on. In 1916, that's when a lot of the divisions started happening. I, they had the power, so can't they just group people if they're in power? I mean, what does it mean to be, what does it mean to be in power? In 1912, petroleum was discovered in Iran. 
that had a huge impact on the rest of the world. In 1916 to 19, that is when the British were controlling, especially the north part of Iran, Persia. They were exporting people as fighters and food and oil and resources. In 1917 to 18, talks began about what to do with all of the Jewish people. Look up that declaration that says that we should take over Palestine and put them there. In 1918, the war to end all war ends. In 1919, the Treaty of Versailles happened, and most of the world think that every, everything's going to be okay now. They came in, they took their natural resources, they made new divisions, and everything should be peaceful. Except World War I was blamed on Germany. They had to pay a bunch of fines that put them into a Great Depression, which allowed for other terrible things to happen. In 1921, the United Kingdom, Russia, and America established a monarchy in Iran, thinking that everything was fine now. Who did they put in power? In the 1920s, they put in power this guy, Reza Shah Pahlavi. And he was already in the government. He was in the government from childhood. He seemed like a perfect candidate. He was not opposing the Brits being in Iran taking petroleum. But as soon as he started getting power, he was emancipating Iran's foreign policies, no longer allowing the British government, the American government, and the Soviets to come in and take whatever they wanted without giving proper payment to the people. He started building things in Iran. He emancipated women who at that time were forced to be Muslim. Uh, that's making the hijab illegal. Hijab, that's a really important word here for this part of the land. A hijab is a way for a person to express modesty, self-respect. It's just a way for a person to cover themselves in a way that makes them feel as a human being, not just some object. There's lots of different ways to do this. On the screen, you just see four ways with four names that if you want to learn more, just, you know, your phone, just like put it in there and learn more. It's all there for free. Hedgehog is this idea that people should respect themselves and God, men and women. And in Iran, people were required to wear the hijab. But the first king, the Shah, that the Brits in America put in power, removed that. Don't think that was liberation. Remember, a lot of religions have this idea that people should be modest and cover up and not put their body on display as if that's the only thing you have going on. On the left is a Christian nun. On the right is a Hindu religious person. Religious people from all sorts of religions cover up. It's not just Muslims. But if you are Muslim and you live there, you are no longer allowed to cover up if that's what you wanted to do out of respect for yourself. That freedom was removed from you. If it's oppressing women to require that they cover up, is it oppressing women to forbid, to make it illegal to cover up? Hitler starts coming to power, and that really worries Russia and America that Iran is not going to cooperate. Iran is really well placed for supplying Russia with materials to fight the Nazis. And so what do they do? They make it the case that they can use Iran by doing a bunch of propaganda, which was not illegal at the time. And they have the king exiled, whose son comes home from Switzerland, where he was getting an extraordinary Western education. And then his son takes over, 1941. If fighting Nazis is good, then is stealing land as a base and food for soldiers justified? Like you want to steal this for some good, good reason. Like it's a good reason. So can you just. The white revolution is essentially westernizing of Iran. That's what they called it themselves. Women were uh, having the right to vote. 1963. In 73, there was a lot of money being made by the Iranian government. 1975, Family Protection Act modified to guarantee rights to women, not just the right to vote. And there were a ton of women that said, what? I'm allowed to do things? And then they started going to school. And then they started getting in politics. They started doing a bunch of things. 
and Iran was doing really well. Really well. If you consider men and women getting an education that's not segregated, if you consider universities that teach English, if you consider women dressing however they want. Uh, wait a minute, they couldn't dress however they wanted. So they were emancipated, but it was illegal for them to cover up if they wanted to be. Okay, we see a lot of blooming in the cities. We see women becoming surgeons in 1971. We see women are still beauty icons. America and Iran had great relationships. On the surface, Iran was doing really great as a government and as a nation. Is westernization always good? And what does that even mean? What does it mean to westernize the Middle East or anywhere? In the background, so going back now, 1923, Khomeini, that's that guy, he's studying Islam in Qom. Qom is one of the most religious parts of Iran. In 1930s, he starts publishing against this whole pro-Western thing, and we tracked the Western thing from 1921 to the 1960s. In the 30s, he's already publishing that this is not going to be good. In 1947-48, when the United Nations declared that Palestine was going to be divided, that 700 thousand Palestinians were going to be taken out of their land so that Israelis could go in. Khomeini wrote, this is not good. And what did he do? He published that the Shah of Iran was going to pay for this. He also wrote that it would be wrong to allow people to join the government if they're not Muslims. The Baha'i are a different faith. There's lots of different religions. Baha'i is a religion that's not Muslim. And if we take away the requirement for someone to swear on the Quran that they will uphold the nation's values, then even someone who's not believing in the Quran could take office. And that's what the Shah wanted to do. He wanted to westernize. He didn't want you to have to be Muslim just to be in the government. But this guy over there in Gom is writing, wait a minute, that the Baha'i people are going to start getting into office. Like, like, that's a bad thing. In 1963, when the Shah was doing all of these things, he, Khomeini literally wrote, the Shah is submitting to America and Israel. What happens in 1963, the government comes in to this place where lots of Islamic scholars are studying and writing anti-government things. They shoot a bunch of people, they kill a bunch of people, and they take Khomeini into prison. He doesn't get to come back into freedom until 1979, the revolution. In 1964, he was exiled to Turkey. They were Muslim, but a totally different kind of Muslim, and they outlawed his version of Muslim, so he couldn't wear what he wanted to wear. He fled, he went to Iraq, then he went to France. He lived in France for a very long time using the BBC to publish his ideas. In 1963, he was communicating with the Kennedy administration. We understand an American president, a presence is necessary in Iran to counter the Russians. We are not opposed. Of course, that was the year that Kennedy was assassinated. Remember, the president assassinated, same year, same time. 1978, he's communicating with the Carter administration, saying, hey, if you let the Muslims come and take control, we're still going to give you your petroleum. In the key meeting at the White House situation, January 11th, the CIA predicted Khomeini would just sit back and let his moderate Western educated followers run. Scroll down to the bottom with me. We have decided that it is desirable to establish a direct American channel to Khomeini's entourage. It's all in the background. In 1978, Khomeini from France, using the BBC to get his ideas out there, tells his pro-Muslim people in a very westernizing Iran to take to the streets and to protest. That's exactly what they did. 
This is a, a picture of people in the street demanding that they can be Muslim, demanding that the Shah stop westernizing their country. The Muslims begin protesting just as Khomeini told them to do. In January of 1979, the Shah flees. Also in 79, the Iranian military surrenders. Khomeini comes back, takes over, and that's the 1979 Islamic Revolution. In 1979, the Shah ran away and Khomeini became the supreme leader. That's definitely a revolution. Complete change of values and plans and trajectory and intentions. If you look at the last 100 years of Iranian history, four men have ran the entire 100 years. Father, son, and then two supreme leaders. Four men. Think of how many presidents we've had in the last 100 years. Okay, Iran has presidents. They have democracy. The people do vote. But above the president is a supreme leader. He can add rules, delete rules, change rules without asking anybody. He is literally the head of the country. And they've had two. Since 1979, marriage for girls was reduced to nine, but later it was to 13. It's illegal for women to dance in public, to sing in public, to be in public without a veil, to marry without permission, to leave the country without permission. Music is outlawed. Alcohol is outlawed. If you go to Iran, there's no bars. There's no alcohol. It's outlawed. Everything that goes against Islam is against the law in Iran. And so, okay, that kind of explains why in 1977, 8, 9, thousands of people left Iran. And if you were leaving because you wanted freedom, then that would make sense why you came to America, which is, a, last time I checked, a, a global symbol of freedom. The veil abolished in 1936, required in 1979. This woman wrote a really extraordinary book. The title is in the bottom left corner. And in there, she explains what's happening to women in Iran. They weren't free during the westernization, and they're not free during the Islamification. As soon as 1979 revolution happened, hundreds and thousands of people began living in fear. Anyone who said anything against Islam would go missing, would get sick, would get fired, would end up dead. There were public hangings, mass public hangings. And it's all recorded. These are just the facts. These are just the facts. These are the agreed upon facts. It gets worse. Is a government killing their own civilians? Like, do they have a right? Do we have a right to, like, if they're killing their people, do we have a right to go in and tell them not to do that? Okay, that's rights. What do we have a right to do? What do we have the obligation to do if some people over there are hurting some people over there? Are we obligated to go and help? Let's fast forward to 2022. From 1979 until 2022, thousands of people were murdered at the hands of the Iranian government because it became illegal to do anything against Islam, their version of Islam the Shiite version of Islam, their interpretation of the Shiite version of Islam. Islam has lots of different forms. If you go to Saudi Arabia, you're going to see a totally different version of Islam. There's Sunnis, there's Shiites, there's Wahhabi, there's Sufi, there's lots of different denominations or movements. Lots of women were in the streets without the hijab, and the police is allowed, allowed to kill them. I wanted to add videos because I found a video from my Instagram feed of an Iranian police officer saying she was in the street like a whore. We could kill her. The police, the government, the laws, thousands of women. This is just one of the famous ones that came out of Iran and made global news. She was a woman who was in the public 
and she wasn't properly wearing her headscarf and she was beaten by police and she died. And millions of people protested the inhumane treatment of that woman. People were protesting. The police cracked down on protest. The police in Iran shoots live ammunition at protesters. Live ammunition. Is protesting good? Like something's wrong over there and then I get up and start screaming about it. Is that helpful? Lots of people have been protesting in Iran, out of Iran, and we know that the government is killing their own people, turning off the internet, not allowing people to join forces. People all over the world are trying to make noise to bring justice to the women in Iran. Thousands of people have died because they have demanded, just like asked, for freedom. Lots of people who protested died. What was their charge? Doing something against God. If you're convicted of a crime and your punishment is capital punishment, Islamic law says that you cannot be killed. If you're a virgin, you don't qualify for capital punishment. So if you've seen in the news that Iranian government is raping people, uh, once you're no longer a virgin, then the government can execute you. So government officials are properly marrying criminals, having sex with them, qualifying them for capital punishment, and then executing them. Thousands of people. These are just the agreed upon facts. These are just things that are happening in our world now, here's some more evidence. People who are talking about it are getting fired or going into jail. And then there's the poisonings of the girls' school. School is for boys. There's a different school for girls, totally different curriculum. And all across the nation, they were poisoning schoolgirls. Over 7,000 proven cases of poisoning. One woman was asking the principal of the school what's happening, and the police, they beat her. It's all on tape. If you don't want to believe me, get on your phone and Google it. Look at the evidence. There was a journalist who was writing about this. He went missing. There was a journalist who wrote about this. She's in prison now. She also, just last month, won the Nobel Peace Prize. She is still in prison. Actually, she just ended her hunger strike. Um, she went into surgery and she needed to go to the hospital. They wouldn't take her to the hospital until she covered her head. She said, I'm not going to cover my head. And then they wouldn't take her to the hospital. So she started a hunger strike. Are Iran's actions ethical? If you look at how they rank on gender equality, it's really, really low. One of the worst on the whole planet. And yet the United Nations let them chair Human Rights Council. If Iran is doing something that we believe is unethical and we're just watching, like, can we justify ignoring the oppression of others? So now I want to say what I think some people's values are. And then using those values, we can choose which theory we want to say we believe in. And then you have to use your theories to call an action unethical. If you ever want to call anything unethical, you need a theory according to which it's unethical. You need underlying values. If you don't believe in anything, you can't say that something is right or wrong. I'm also noticing that it's five minutes to three. So I'm just going to keep going since I started. And if you have to leave, please do. So we need some values. In the Declaration of the United States, the Declaration of Independence, it says that every human being is equal. And if you look up equality or liberty or freedom, you get this idea that you're not going to be oppressed, that nobody is going to force you to do something that is bad for you. And if you look at Thomas Jefferson, he said that if you're going to limit somebody's freedom, then freedom is lost. You can't limit freedom without losing freedom. Other people have said very similar things. Martin Luther King Jr said that we have it all. We have to have it all. We all have to have it. 
So if we find out that some people over there are not free, then what does that say about our freedom or our apparent idea that we're free? Martin Luther King Jr. Freedom is like that. I think, I think we agree. I think that those are our values. If we don't speak up for other people, there'll be no one free to stick up for us. I think, I think what's on the screen, I think what we agree with that. Toni Morrison, how could we call ourselves free if we don't think we're free enough or powerful enough to free other people? Audrey Lord here. I am not free while any woman is unfree. So if those are our values, and I'm not saying there are, I'm just questioning if that's what we value, then we can choose some normative theories. And I teach this in my class. We could choose normativity or normative theories according to which actions are wrong. Anytime you're saying that something is wrong, you're making a normative claim. It's charged. You're saying what should happen or should not happen. Normative ethics are the theories according to which you can claim that an action is right or wrong. Deontology is a normative ethical theory that values universalizability. According to deontology, if you say something is wrong, then it's wrong for everyone, everywhere, always, no matter what. But there's other theories. Um, there's also divine command theory, according to which anything that God says, that's what's good. Think about Abraham and Isaac, the famous story out of the Bible. Why was it good that Abraham was willing to kill his son? Because God told him to do that. Anything that God says is good. That's where you get your theories of what's right and wrong from God, according to this theory, divine command theory. But there's other ones. What about democracy? What about what's best for the majority? You could be a utilitarian. Pleasure, happiness, well-being, the lack of suffering for the majority. Maybe you're a utilitarian. You could be one of these three theories and not know it because you haven't studied it, but you can write it down and you can look up it later and you can see what you subscribe to. Let's take those theories, let's apply it to these actions. Did you know that in Iran, if you do anything homosexual, that's punishable by death? I mean, we're talking about women going in public without covering their head, but we could be talking about any portion of what Iran's policies are. In 2022, Iran was helping Russia, giving them over 100 drones to use to kill people in Ukraine. Is what Iran is doing, is it ethical according to what? If you wanna say that some action is wrong, you need a theory. That's how philosophy works. It's wrong according to something, based on some values of what's good. According to deontology, what Iran is doing is not ethical because rape is always wrong, killing is always wrong, silencing someone who's peaceful is always wrong. But according to divine command theory, you can argue that what Iran is doing is ethical because they're Muslim, following the Muslim law, they're following Sharia. So maybe cultural relativism then, maybe they're doing what they do, so let's stay out of it. Why do we think we can go over there and tell them that what they're doing is wrong? Maybe. If people agree that something is correct, should we just let them do it? But you have to remember, the Persians are not Muslim. I mean, they are now, and they have been since the Islamic conquests, but the Persians are Zoroastrian. Well, if a group conquers another group, then is it ethical to require that they convert to the winner's religion? According to Islam, you're not allowed to require anyone to be Islamic. Islam must be a choice. So this one's complicated. Yes and no. What Iran is doing is and is not ethical depending on what you call ethical. If you like democracy, same thing, very hairy. This is a huge, huge problem. It's hard to say what's right and wrong. You can be utilitarian and argue what Iran is doing is right, and you could argue to say that it's wrong. Thousands of people are protesting right now to get rid of the Islamic revolution, its products, its consequences. 
This is happening 2022, 2023. The Iranian people don't want an Islamic government, but uh, yes, they do. Remember when they were marching, bring it in? So if we say that what is right is what the people want and we should allow democracy, what do we do if there's millions of people and some are arguing for it and some are arguing against it? So this gets very complicated even when you pick a normative theory according to which to say that something is wrong. Now we can think lastly about these global considerations. America has spent $38 billion just in 2021. This is before Russia started attacking Ukraine and we started funding Ukraine. Just in 2021, $38 billion have left America. So you might be thinking, what about Americans? What about Americans? Okay, so should we spend American resources in foreign countries? Just, just the question, just the question. And who should we be giving it to? America is buying things from Iran, which is empowering Iran. But if you zoom back out, 1946 to 2022, again, before Ukraine, just to 22. America spent that much to Israel, that much to Vietnam, that much to Egypt, that much to Afghanistan. Look at how many billions of dollars have left America to help other places. Thinking about Ukraine, which came later, in the end of 2022 going forward, we have promised, we, America, $115 billion over the future, or the future. We're planning to give them $4 billion in 2029. If we spend American resources in foreign countries, how do we choose who to help? Like, so this question says, assume we believe we should help other people. We, America, we should help other people. That's good. Okay, who do we help? We're not sending money to North Korea, even though we know that there's people in North Korea who are dying. How about South Sudan? I remember growing up and there was a problem in Darfur. It's still a problem now. In fact, it's worse. What about Ethiopia? Millions of people, children. What about Afghanistan? What about Syria? What about Yemen? Yemen, one of the largest humanitarian crises of our time, more than 4.5 million people have been displaced. What about Yemen? I don't think that I could talk about Iran without talking about everything else because we are all connected. We can all help each other. We can all hurt each other. And the question becomes, who should we help? Who should we hurt? Is, it, is anything we do ever justified? These are just questions. This whole talk was using the Socratic method where you have an idea and you question the idea. You have another idea and you question that idea. There's a handout if you still want one. Thank you for your time.